If you guys go to Exodus 17 real quick, I've got something that it's been on my heart all week on Exodus 17. I almost preached it this morning and just kind of connect some dots today without preaching to some people that were downtrodden and discouraged. There's several people I ran into. Uh, one of the last guys, I think his, his name was McKnight. And uh, as you, I walked up to the door, I mean, you could just tell that this guy was an eccentric. Um, you could tell, by the way, that the front of his house is decorated, the signs that he had, you know, uh, legally armed citizen and uh, no trespassing, I'll shoot. I mean, all sorts of really neat kind of, you know, eccentric, you know, the average soul winner might walk up to a house like that and say, oh, I don't know if I want to mess with this person. I might just best stay away. Uh, I went up there anyway. I said, well, you know, actually, I'm, I'm not packing today, but I want to go talk to him anyway. I said, no, I'm not going to get in a gunfight. I'm here to, Lord willing, get in a sword fight or uh, iron sharpeneth iron. If this guy, because he says, I'm one of those bitter people. That was one of the signs. I'm one of those bitter people that clings on to my guns and my religion. That was the sign on the front door that triggered me the most. And I thought, well, cool. Well, other than the bitter part, maybe there's something there. Maybe, maybe this guy is saved and he just needs some encouragement. If not, he at least, you know, puts it out there that he's religious and uh, believes in self-defense as Brother Doug's uh, going to preach here, Lord willing, in a minute. But um, in Hebrews, before we read Exodus 17, in Hebrews chapter 12, I'll just read it to you. It says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Lift up the hands that which hang down and the feeble knees. We're supposed to support the weak. We're supposed to help people where they're at. And I love soul winning in the regard that there's the opportunity to go find people that are downtrodden, that are discouraged, that are out from uh, being with brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and they need to hear a good word. They need to be encouraged. And I spent several minutes with this guy, McKnight, uh, just scripture to scripture to scripture didn't even get to open my bible but that's all that went back and forth was scripture and i'm encouraging him in eternal security and i'm pointing him to the fact that it was all completed by jesus it's none of his works and this guy hasn't been in church since covid he's been out of church and well they're meeting again but i'm not there we still we've decided to stay out and uh, I've been really meditating on Exodus 17 a few times this week. And I was thinking about this with lifting up the heavy hands. Because this is that story of Moses where Moses was going through uh, trying to hold up his hands as they're fighting Amalek. And we see Aaron and her helping hold the hands. And as I read this story, what I'm thinking this week is like, often there are times I need somebody to hold my hands. Right? But we come to church and I'm looking for you to be a Moses and I want to hold up your hands. When we go out soul winning, we're looking for somebody that's having a hard time holding up their hands and I want to help lift up those hands and encourage them. Look in Exodus chapter 17. Look at verse number 1. It says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Now look, the Lord's brought them here. He brought them out. He's protected them. And then the people begin to get angry. Remember, these people still have some Egypt on them. They still have some Egypt in them. Right? And as we go through this walk in this life, there's going to be people that try to drag us down. Well, why, do you, why are you still having children? Why didn't you stop it too? Why are you trying to teach your own? They, there's a government organization that will gladly do that. Right? I mean, the world wants to pull us down and wear us out and make us weary in well-doing and try to discourage us. And that's what we see here is they still have that attitude and that spirit that came with them from Egypt. Verse number 3 says, And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Look at that. Moses. So Moses is under attack here. They're, they're, he's being accused of bringing them out into the wilderness to kill them by thirst. But look at Moses' reaction because he's here trying to help these people. These people have turned on him and say, hey, now you're the bad guy. And listen, in your Christian life, there will be people you're trying to help that will actually turn against you. They will fight against you. They'll find fault with you. They'll try to tear you down and wear you out. And Moses cried unto the Lord. Let me open up with a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that You would fill me with Your Holy Spirit. Lord, You've laid this message on my heart all week, and, and I don't even know what to preach here, Lord, but I trust You to provide. Lord, I believe that You've called us to go out and to help those and, and lift up the downtrodden and preach the Gospel and to confirm the souls and to compel people uh, to come into Your house. And Lord, I thank You for this, uh, this fellowship that we have tonight, and I just pray that You would get all the glory tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? Look what they accused him. Back in verse 3, he says, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? What an accusation. Say, Moses, you've intentionally brought us here. We have no resources. We're going to die. It's all your fault. I want you to hold your place here. We're going to come back. But go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Sometimes in the Christian life, there are people that, that you want to help. There's extended family, there's friends, there's people at work, and they end up turning on you. They get upset with you. They're discouraged by maybe your choices. And that's what the situation that Moses is in. Now, mind you, we're going to see what happens, how people help Moses. And I'm not asking you to look at this story and think of me as the Moses and feel bad for me. I want you to put yourself in the, in the position of Moses. You're the guy. You're the hero of the story. You're the Christian going through the walk on your own. God is with you. You're trying to help other people people and sometimes people are going to try to pull you back and drag you down and wear you out and it's going to take everything that you have to stay in this Christian walk there's a battle we're going to see and it literally wears Moses physically out and that's kind of the Christian life you're in Deuteronomy 13 these people begin to say something false look at verse th chapter one uh, chapter 13 verse number one if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which has not served, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So here's the warning. If a prophet stands up and he says, Something will happen, I'll show you something. And he's saying, And now let's go serve another god. Verse 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul. You think about Moses' reaction here. He knows that they're out of water. He knows that he's in trouble. They're in the wilderness. He's probably thirsty himself. He's doubting. He's wondering, Lord, what's next? Lord, where are you? And, and what do they say? Oh, the Lord be among us. And here they come. They're saying, listen, we're not even supposed to be here. You brought us out here to kill us. It's you. It's, and it's a problem. So what does he do? He has confidence in God. He goes to God. His response is prayer to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord was proving him to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Verse 4, he says, Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put away evil from the midst of thee. You know what should have happened? The people should have rose up and said, wait, this guy that's saying we're going to die from no, from no water, that the Lord has forsaken us, that Moses is trying to kill us, we should get rid of this guy. Right? You think about the attitude here. The warning is to the people. He's saying the people should reject somebody when they have that false message. Verse 6, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, now it's getting real close here, now it's hitting home. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, Namely, the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him. He's saying, listen, when somebody tries to encourage you to go in another direction, away from the Lord, away from the foundation you know, he says, don't consent, don't give in, don't go with them, don't go along with it. He says, but thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thou and I pity him, Neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thy hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. This is quite a judgment. 
listen, the warning here was that the, that the people were being pulled in the wrong direction. They went into a land with false gods, with evil gods, and they were warned not to follow after those gods. Be separate. Be distinct. Don't be like them. Don't make a league with them. And so here's that warning. When somebody begins to go down that slippery slope, don't consent. In fact, don't conceal. Don't cover it up. You should be the first one to put them to death. Verse 10, And thou shalt stone him with stones, that he die, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. What was the purpose of it that others would hear and fear? This is often why God judges things publicly and shows things so that others say, oh, I don't want to disobey. In fact, it uses this same phrase in Acts chapter 5 when you say it with Ananias and Sapphira. When they thought they would lie to the Holy Spirit and say, oh, we sold a property for all this, but they're going to keep some back. Hey, they could have kept all of it. That was up to them. But they said, no, we're giving you all that we sold it for. And the, the, the man of God was like, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? You're not lying to me. They wanted to be seen of men. And so the Holy Spirit killed them. They laid out dead. And they said all would hear and fear. In the early church, it created this environment of fear of lying against the Spirit of God. This is very important. This is how God wants us to judge. This is something that we need to consider. I think we've lost that in, in Christianity today. It's kind of, well, do whatever feels good to you or say whatever you want and then blame God for it. We know Pentecostalism is famous for that where they'll get up and get excited and say something crazy and then blame it on God and say, well, God told me to say that. That's a, a word from the Holy Ghost or something. It's like, no, that's not how God operates. And so here we see, he says, when you, when you have a false prophet like that, it should be judged. And he says in verse 11, And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. If thou shalt hear, say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and hath withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and let us serve other gods which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, then shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly. And that all that is in therein and the cattle thereof and the edge of the sword. And you think about this. This is actually what we're going to see this Wednesday. when we And we may come back to this a little bit on Wednesday. But this is what we'll see in Wednesday. Right? What happened? Well, uh, in Benjamin, there was folly. There were sodomites, sons of the devil. And yeah, they had overtaken the city. And, and Benjamin did not stand up and judge it. So it's going to come down where everybody had to inquire. They're going to come find out and they're going to judge it. He says in verse 15, Thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city, which the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. And thou shalt gather all the spoil of it into the midst of the street thereof, and burn it with fire, with fire the city and all the spoil thereof, every whit, for the Lord thy God, and it shall be in heap forever, and it shall not be built again. And there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand, that the Lord may turn thee from the fierceness of his anger, and show thee mercy, and have compassion upon thee, and multiply thee as he hath sworn unto thy fathers. Now, why do they do that? And judges will see they did it because uh, it was necessary. They had to judge righteous judgments. And here he's saying, listen, when somebody comes out and says, hey, let's go serve Baal. Let's serve another God. A God that we haven't known. A new God. The newly sprang up God. He's saying, listen, you need to judge it. You need to deal with it if you want God to bless you. Notice he says that. He says uh, in verse 17, and have compassion upon thee and multiply thee as he hath sworn unto thy fathers. If you want God's compassion and you want Him to bless you, you need to obey. And when there's a false prophet, you need to deal with it. And this is hard sometimes. I mean, uh, dealing with things like this in the workplace or just out in the world or even out soul winning. I mean, there was another person I spoke to today. And man, I mean, they were all over the place. And I just, and I'm talking to this lady. There's five or six bikes. Like it was obviously a biker household. And this little lady comes out, older lady, and I'm speaking with her. And then a few minutes later, uh, a, a gentleman a little bit taller than me and a little bit more muscle bound than me and much darker than me comes out and he's like mom is there a problem 
And he's looking right into me, leaning right into me. Meanwhile, I'm leaning into her compassionately trying to tell her that she is not trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation. She may name the name of Christ, but she's saying, well, you can't live however you want. I mean, if I went and murdered somebody tomorrow, then surely I'm not saved. That would be evidence that I'm not saved. And so I'm trying to compassionately compel this woman that she is trusting in her own works. And she agreed with that. And I said, if I can show you that the Bible says otherwise, do you want to see it? Well, yes, I do. Meanwhile, this guy is still, I mean, he's getting up in my space, grunting at me. I'm not afraid of him. I'm afraid of not telling the truth. I'm afraid of a judgment for God for allowing a false prophecy to remain. And so I dealt with it and I talked to her. And I mean, she, well, you're right. That is what the Bible says. That is different. I get, and finally he backs off and, and, and the girlfriend comes out and a bunch of other people, a bunch of other stuff goes on. But, but she got it. She understood. She was beginning to understand that, hey, she's trusting in her own works, literally. And I asked her, can you go to heaven by trusting in your own works? And by the time I'm, I'm done with what short interaction we had, she was in agreement that she could not. When he says in verse 17, uh, he says, And there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand, that the Lord may turn from his fierceness of his anger, and show thee mercy, and have compassion upon thee, and multiply thee as he hath sworn unto thy fathers. When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep all of his commandments which I command you this day, and to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God. Now what do we do that's right according to this passage? We rebuke the false prophet. We have to tell somebody when they're not saved. That's a hard thing to do. And listen, it will wear you out. Go back to Exodus chapter 17. But the point here is that as we go through this Christian walk, it is a battle. There is spiritual warfare. And people are going to try to steal your righteousness from you. They are going to try to dissuade you from living the Christian life. They're going to try to trick you and deceive you and beguile you. Yea, they're going to try to tempt you. And the warning here is to not be weary in well-doing. We're supposed to lift up the heavy hands. God has chosen you. As, you. as we read this, put yourself in the place of Moses. There are people that you will save and deliver that you can help if only you don't wear out. If only you don't give up. Verse 4 again, look what he says. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Oh, man. Boy, he had a, that was pretty tough, isn't it? It reminds me of David shortly after uh, what happened at Ziklag where they took all of the families and they were ready to kill David. They were going to stone David. It says he encouraged himself and the Lord his God. That's, I mean, David was known for writing these psalms and saying, Lord, help me. Lord, I, I can't do this. Lord, I need your help. And so we see Moses in a similar situation. He's calling on the name of the Lord. Verse 5, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thy hand and go. So he's taken his rod, the sign of authority that God's given him that he's done miracles through before. Verse 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Now wait a minute. Who, who are we dealing with here? Who will stand on the rock? The angel of the Lord. Right? God will stand on the rock. God's going to reveal Himself to Moses on a rock. Behold, I will stand there before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He wanted to make sure there was a witness of everything. I want you to see this miracle. And imagine this, right? So he says, um, he's going before them, let me to go on before them, verse 5. Go on before the people and take with thee the elders, right? So imagine that. He gathers up the elders. He's got the rod of God. He goes before them. He sees the rock that God is standing on. And before the elders, he smites the rock and water comes out. Verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Wasn't that their say? Is God with us or not? Is He really here? He's going to leave us to die? So what does God do? He shows Himself. He stands on a rock. He says, hit the rock and water will come out. So imagine they're before the people. I imagine this water comes out so greatly that all the people as they're following, they begin to see the miracle. Where's all this water coming from? Right? They see evidence of that the Lord is with them. But He gives it these unique names because uh, they're chiding, they're arguing, they're uh, having problems with Moses and with God. And their question is, is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek 
and fought with Israel in Rephidim. No sooner do they have the victory, they get the water they want, and what happens? Amalek. One of the worst, most wicked enemies that we see in the Older Testament early on. Amalek. I mean, uh, uh, an enemy for generations. All of a sudden, oh, you got a victory, now we're here to attack. Right? Just like Jericho and then Ai, oftentimes in the Christian life, it is a roller coaster. Things go really well, and then, oh no, what are we going to do? And then God picks you back up, and He gets you back going again. Listen, let's look what he says here. Look at Moses' response. Verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. He said, Moses says, let's, let's pick the men. Let's send them out to war. Verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses... Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So again, another miracle. God's working through this staff, this rod of God, he calls it now. He's showing the power and the significance of miracles that are worked through God as he holds this staff. But guess what? He's getting tired. They're winning against the enemy. Oh, and then things stop, right? He's wearing out. He's falling down. He's, his hands are getting heavy. Look what he says, verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek and Moses. Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Now think about that. Again, I want you to apply this to yourself. I want you to apply this to yourself. In the Christian life, there's going to come times when your hands will be heavy. Normally, we go out and we lift up the heavy hands. We encourage the downtrodden. Well, you will have times when your hands are too heavy for you. You're wore out. I don't know if I can keep doing this. Things are just too hard. But God will send somebody to help. Look what he does. Look in verse 12. He says, But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. What a blessing. Now, I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine here what, what type of a rock or a boulder they bring this. I, I'm thinking he's leaning against it, not really just sitting. I don't know. I could be wrong on that. It doesn't really matter. What matters is God sent two men, right hand and left hand, to lift him up, to encourage him to hold up his hands. And listen, sometimes we're her. Sometimes we're Aaron who will take that rod from Moses and continue, right? Sometimes it's up to us to be the guy to encourage your brother or sister when they're downtrodden. But I want you to put yourself in the position of Moses. You will have days when your hands are too heavy. But God will answer your prayer. He will hear your cry. He'll give you a rock to sit on. He'll give you friends to hold up your hands. I mean, that's how God works. And He puts us here, puts this here to help encourage us and see this great victory. Verse 12, But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it underneath him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the sun. I love this. He says, No, it didn't happen. I want a great account. I want a good record and an account. Rehearse it to Joshua, because where's Joshua? Well, how come Joshua wasn't holding up his hand? Well, that was what Mo Moses was supporting Joshua by holding his hands. And then her is supporting Moses while Moses is supporting you. Follow so listen, whether you're Joshua or you're Aaron or you're Moses, you're her, we work together as a team for the Lord. There was a great victory right here and it started with Moses. Hey, when the false prophets came up, now Moses didn't put him to death as we see later, but he stood up. He went to the Lord. His confidence was in the Lord. Verse 15, And Moses built an altar... And called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is one of the few places we see the name Jehovah in the Bible. This is a very short chapter in all reality. It's 16 verses. And we see that it's called Jehovah Nisi. He's telling us because the Lord hath sworn 
that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And who's going to deliver? The Lord will. Listen, I, this has been just on my heart here recently. Uh, if you're Moses, if you're Aaron, if you're Joshua, wherever you are in this story, there's going to come a point where you need somebody else helping you. And I really want you to focus on you being that Moses. That you're helping push Joshua. You're keeping Joshua in the battle. I know a lot of mothers stay back or uh, try to help with the children when we go out and preach the gospel. Well, guess what, Mom? You're Moses. Your husband is Joshua. And Joshua can't win the battle when your hands get weary, when you let your hands down. And hey, call on your oldest child to be her, right? Uh, call on a friend. I mean, have sisters in Christ that you can communicate with to encourage you in this battle. Because listen, it's a spiritual battle and God gives us these physical illustrations to tell us your hands will get heavy. You'll get wore out. You'll get tired. And the warning here, don't get weary in well-doing. Don't give up in this fight. God will provide a way, but if you get disheartened and discouraged and down in the mouth, you're likely to convince yourself there's nothing we could do. Imagine if Moses' response was the same as these false prophets saying, the Lord brought us out here to kill us. What if Moses said, yeah, you're probably right. He wants us to fail. He probably doesn't care about us anymore. I know. He probably is done with me and wants to throw me away. Imagine if Moses had that attitude. He wouldn't have had this great victory over Amalek. We wouldn't see this passage where he reveals a name of the Lord, Jehovah Nisi, demonstrating the power of the Lord over the enemy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would help us to remember uh, that you've called us together to encourage each other, to lift each other up, to build each other up. Lord, I thank you for the ministry we have of going out and preaching the gospel. Lord, I thank you for the seeds that were planted today uh, that that may be watered and one day have increase. Lord, I thank You for those that got saved today, that chose to put their trust in You. Lord, it's a gift from You to be able to go out and to preach this. And Lord, we value this. Lord, we want to go out and lift up the downtrodden. We want to lift up the weary hands. We want to encourage the people. And Lord, I pray that You would continue to give us a space of grace here, that You would give us time to be able to accomplish these things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, man, I stole your time. Um, actually, Brother Luke, I promised you could preach. Brother Luke, if you, man, I'm going to steal your time and we'll give it to Brother Luke. Yours is short. Go ahead. And then close this out, please. All right. Let's turn to Jude chapter number one. Jude chapter number one. I don't really have to say Jude chapter number one. There's not even a second chapter. You know, I heard somebody say the only proof for infant baptism, infant baptism, is in Jude chapter two and Joshua chapter twenty-five. So, not much proof. <laughs> Jude chapter number one. I want to read you one of my favorite verses in verse twenty-three. Jude chapter one, verse twenty-three says, "And others, save with fear." pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Wow, that sounds pretty crazy. With fear, pulling them out of the fire. Wow, I want to title this Souls to Rescue. On May 8, 1706, that's a long time ago, a boy was sleeping soundly as his family made a speedy evacuation of the property. Minutes later, he was awakened by a light in his room. This little boy dashed to the door to find it locked. This little boy ran to the window. The ceiling's on fire. He's locked in a room, and the, he finds the window unlocked. Six-year-old little boy's name's John. He raises the window, sees his family and friends outside. They've already got out of the house. The house is burning down. He's in the second story. So he yells for help, and they see him up in the second story. The house is burning down. It's all on fire. The ceiling's on fire. Everything around him on fire. And they run for the stairs to go get the little boy. And the stairs have collapsed. He's stuck on the second story, burning. The whole house is burning. So he's hopeless. He's helpless. All of a sudden, a neighbor shouts out orders. A big, sturdy neighbor. Big, large shoulders. Big, nice, big, broad shoulders. He braces himself against the wall. And another neighbor gets on top of his shoulders. 
and snatches John Wesley out of the second story of a burning building, and then right as they pull him out, boom, whole building collapses. And that's pulling somebody out of a fire <laughs> right before they die, right there. He was pulled out of the fire. Let me tell you another story. This one's found in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter number 16. The book of Acts, I heard somebody say, what is the second sharpest weapon? There is, other than the sword of the spirit. And the little boy raised his hand and said, the Acts of the Apostles. I'm not sure if he got the spelling right on that one. But in the book of Acts chapter 16, we find a story in the later portion of the chapter about Paul and Silas. They were, they were in prison for doing good stuff. And they were in prison and they set over them a jailer. Now the jailer in the Roman times had a scary job. His job was to keep those prisoners in that prison or he died. That's scary. I'd keep those prisoners safe. We find him in, 20, in verse 26, it says, and suddenly there was an earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Ooh, it's not looking good for the jailer, I have to say. The way is wide open for the prisoners and if they walk out, jailer dies. So it says, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, what is he doing? He's sleeping. His life's on the line, and he's just sleeping. So he's sleeping. The door's open. Bands are loose. Handcuffs fall off. And the guys could just walk right out if they wanted to. His life's depending on this. It says, he sees, uh, and seeing the prison doors open, draws out his, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. He realizes, oops, I was sleeping. Life's over. Prisoners are gone. Doors are open. Handcuffs are off. They're gone. So he pulls out his sword and is about to kill himself. And then it says, but, but I have made that my favorite word. But you say, why in the world did you make that your favorite word? I love the word, but if it weren't for the word, but, I'd be on my way to hell. Yeah, come on. Because it says in Romans 5, 8, but it says all these bad things. I'm on my way to hell. I'm a sinner. I'm hopeless. But Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us. It says, but God who is rich in mercy. That's a nice word. I like the word, but right here, the word, but saves the jailer's life. He's about to kill himself. It says, but Paul cried with a loud voice. Hey, do thyself no harm. We are all here. Wow. The jailer feels really good about this time. He's feeling really good. They're all here. And I, he doesn't have to die anymore. He's pretty excited. I'd be pretty excited too. All your prisoners are here. You can stay alive. So he calls for a light. It's dark. They're, in the, they're actually in the dungeon part of the jail. They're in the middle. They don't want these prisoners escaping, but the, all the doors are open. All the bands are off, so he calls for a light. It's dark. It's at night. It's midnight. Paul and Silas were just singing. How many of you sing at midnight? That's, I guess they couldn't sleep or something, but they were singing at midnight. Earthquake happens. They're free, but they stay in, and it becomes a witnessing opportunity. He called for a light and sprang in. That's descriptive language. You know, I took a uh, writing program this last year. And one of the big things they stressed was this descriptive adjectives. I love him. He springs in. He doesn't just walk in. He's excited. He's alive. He is alive. He was about to die, and he is alive. So he springs in and comes trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Right now, his whole life was saved by Paul and Silas remaining in captivity. The door is wide open to leave, but they stayed in prison. And he called for light, sprang him, and came trembling, and fell down before him Paul, Paul and Silas, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. Let me tell you what. He barely made it to get saved. This man, he saved, he was about to die, a lost man. He was literally inches away. He had his sword out. Just a few, just inches away from dying seconds and Paul and Silas stayed in captivity they were able to get this man saved he was snatched out of the fires of hell now I want to ask you a question this evening how do we pull people out of the fires of hell how do we rescue 
souls. I'd like to give you a simple answer from John chapter 1. It's found in the book of John. John chapter 1. This is a great verse. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. I like all the verses, but I have a few favorites. And if I keep saying it's my favorite verse, it's, I still like it. So this is one of my favorite verses. John chapter 1. It's near the end of the chapter. The first part of the chapter I really enjoy too. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. All that great stuff. I want to emphasize verse 42, though. Just the first five words. And he brought him to Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 42 are some of the greatest words in the Bible. And he brought him to Jesus. How do we save people from the fires of hell? How do we rescue souls? We bring them Amen. to Jesus. Good. It's pretty simple. I'd like to ask you another question this evening. And that question... I'll tell you in just a second. In 1989, an 8.2 earthquake struck Armenia, killing 30,000 people. You know, I was thinking about it this evening, and I was thinking, that's a lot of people. 30,000 is a number to us. But if you were to see the heaps of people stacked up, you would go, whoa, that's a lot of people. 30,000 people killed in one earthquake. It was all done in less than four minutes. That shows. Are you ready to die? Wow. wow. Four minutes. 30,000 people hurled headlong into eternity. One little boy was at school during the time of the earthquake. He and 14 other friends were saved by the whole schoolhouse collapsing into a wedge. Build two walls folded down. The floor stayed and it tilted. So he was underground in a wedge formation. Totally dark. Everything super crazy outside, people screaming for help. People are getting killed at the moment, and he is in a wedge with 14 other children. He was saved from being smashed. His father, the father of the boy, as soon as the earthquake was over, rushed out and started digging by hand in the rubbles of the schoolhouse. No matter what, he was going to find his child dead or alive. He started digging. He, people came along telling him, Instead of encouraging him, discouraging him. The parents came along. And the parents would come along and say, what you're doing is useless. They were mourning. They were crying over their children. And he looked at them. And I love his question. His question. When I read this story, I was like, that is the best question. He just asked him, are you going to help me? All the parents would come along crying. Oh, my poor sweetie. My little Johnny. My little Susie. Whatever. And he would say, are you going to help me? And he'd get back to digging. The policeman came along and said, Sir, what you're doing right now is useless. They're all dead. And he said, Are you going to help me? The policeman walked away. The fireman came up and said, Sir, right now, what you're doing is very dangerous. There's gasoline. There's this, there's that. You could die right now. Get out. And he said, Are you going to help me? Single-handedly, he became the hero of that town. He found his son and 14 other children. I want to ask you a question this evening. That question is when people are saying, it's useless. What you're doing is useless. I mean, what are you really going to do out so many? When they ask you, it's dangerous. What you're doing could spread COVID. When they say, when they're crying for revival, we have these people in church and they're crying for revival and they themselves aren't doing anything. I want to ask you, are you going to help me save souls? Are you going to help me rescue the souls that are dangling that right now could be dying? Right now, there's probably people on their deathbed right now. Right now, there's bad things happening. Are you going to help me rescue the souls? Let's pray, bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. And uh, I thank you for this chance to speak tonight. And I thank you for filling me with your spirit and helping me deliver this word. And I uh, ask you to give us a good time of fellowship tonight. And uh, please bless the Morgans as they're coming. And uh, please bless all of us on our way home. In Jesus' name, amen.